Now it's time for us to put the central limit theorem and all the other pieces we've learned regarding it into one application problem. So in the United States, the year each coin was minted is printed on the coin. To find the age of a coin, simply subtract the current year from the year printed on the coin. So in other words, let's say you have a coin in your pocket, it was minted in uh, year 2000, you would just subtract. So if it's currently uh, 2020, you'd subtract 2020 minus 2000, and you'd know the coin is 20 years old. Right? That's the age of the coin. So the age of circulating pennies are right skewed. Assume the ages of circulating pennies have a mean of 12.2 and a standard deviation of 9.9. .9. So if, see if this part makes sense. The age of pennies is right skewed. It looks like this, right? Because most pennies are, say, within the last 30 years. And the older you go for a penny, the more rare it is. So over here, for example, we have old pennies. And over here we have new pennies. And at the very beginning, of course, it's very small because, you know, in any one year you're not presenting that or minting that many pennies. So we have new pennies over here, old pennies over here. There's a peak in the first, you know, 25, 30 years, and then it tapers off. All right, so we are going to draw a random independent sample of size n equals 40 from this population. What is the population, first of all? Well, that would be all circulating pennies. Now circulating means it's in, they're in use, they're in circulation. Um, people are using them as pennies. They're not being saved and um, sold at coin uh, fairs or things, things like that. No convention of coin collectors. So not, none of that. These are circulating pennies. These are pennies that are being used as currency. So used as currency, not as a collectible currency. There we have it. What is the sample? Well, it was 40 circulating pennies, right? So the sample size is 40, and it says it's a random independent, so it'd be random independent group of pennies. I didn't have the right room to write the word circulating, but they would be circulating also. So I guess I should put that in there, circulating pennies. All right, is the variable age of penny quantitative or qualitative? Well, that would be quantitative, right? If you can do subtraction to make it happen, then definitely it's quantitative, right? So um, it's a number that provides meaningful or that we can perform meaningful calculations. So there's a lot of review in this problem, which is good. For example, um, if I have the age, if I know the age of a penny is 30 years, then I can figure out the year it was minted. That's a meaningful calculation. So age of penny has to be quantitative. It's a number that has value. It's not just a number that I use to label things. Like the serial number on the penny, if there is such a thing, doesn't mean anything. Right? All right. Now, which type of observational study is being conducted? Ooh, interesting. That is a blast from the past. That is from section 1.2. So quantitative and qualitative and sample and all of that. All of this is from section 1.1. 1 .1. So this is review. And this question right here is a review of terms that we learned in section 1.2. I always get to know. All right, so let me go back to 1.2 for a second. Cross-sectional were observational studies that collect information about individuals at a specific point in time or over a short period of time. Case control studies are retrospective, meaning they require individuals to look back in time or require the researcher to look at existing records. And you match individuals with a characteristic with those who do not have that characteristic. And cohort is when you follow a group. So imagine like following a group of pennies throughout their life. That'd be interesting. Like where did they go and what did they do? But no, it's cross-sectional for sure, right? We're not doing, we're not comparing pennies that did one thing versus pennies that did another thing. That, that's, that's case control. We're not doing that. And we're definitely not following the pennies over time for like the next 30 years. We follow these pennies. Nope, nope, nope. So it's cross-sectional. We're just getting a snapshot in time of what the pennies are doing. So, so we're considering um, age of pennies right now.
case control is more when you're not when you're comparing two groups. So we're not comparing two groups um, over time. And they're not two groups you design. That's a design experiment. It's two groups that just randomly selected themselves, like smokers versus non-smokers. You didn't make them smoke. They just chose to smoke, right? But we're not doing that, right? And we're definitely not following them, <laughs> not tracking for, you know, multiple years. Um, I guess I could say just over time, right? So if you're tracking over time, over a period of time, that would be a cohort, Right? You're not doing either one of those things. So it's cross-sectional. You're just getting a snapshot. Right? All right, now we want to verify that the conditions of the central limit theorem are met. And actually, this makes me realize there's a typo here. I'm going to take away independence right here. Don't worry, I'm going to make up for it. But I'm going to take that away. So it's not going to be there, and I'll take it away for future semesters. And that would mean that we don't have a random independent group. We just have a random group of pennies. There we go, I rewrote that. So it's a random group of circulating pennies. We don't need the independence to be given to us. Um, as a matter of fact, I'd prefer it if we don't. That way we can see how to do this. So down here, we're going to verify the conditions. So condition number one is random. That part I left in. We kind of always assume it. If it's not given to us, it's pretty safe to assume. But we can assume because it's given. It's given in the problem. So we have a yes, right? I'll, I'll just say yes given when I say given again that means it has to be written in the problem somewhere number two independent all right I know I originally gave this to you but I don't want you to have it you're going to say yes now here's why to be independent, you need your sample size to be less than 5% of your population size right that was the second part of the central limit theorem all right, let me just show it to you right here. We're sampling without replacement, so we want little n to be less than 0.05 capital N. So is little n less than 0.05 capital N? Well, little n was 40. Is that less than 0.05? Now, what's capital N? It's not given to us, so we have to kind of write it out in words. This is the number of all circulating pennies, or it's the quantity, if you will, of all circulating pennies. So is 40 less than 5% of all circulating pennies? Well, yeah, <laughs> of course it is. So this is going to be a little bit of a magic trick. So we don't know what this is, but you and I both know this is huge, right? There's a lot of pennies out there. So this is, of course, I kind of, I usually write, duh, of course, right? Of course, of course it is, right? By logic, it's got to be, right? 40 has got to be less than 5% of all the pennies out there. So it's, it, I'm waving my hand at it a little bit like a magician because I wasn't given the population size. If I was given the population size, I could actually put the number in there, which is a hint maybe for a worksheet, for example. So if you're given the population size, stick it in there and you can find 0.05 of that population size. Here I didn't have the population size, but I can still talk at it and logically show that it must be the case, which is a very important skill to know. So it's very important that we take independence out of that piece up above. Sorry about that. Now, normal is actually really easy to prove. So normal is a yes, and the reason is, I don't know what it, matter of fact, I know it was skewed right. I know this was not normal. So why can't I just say, oh, yep, normal, no problem? Ah, because even if the population's not normal, as long as my sample size is large, then I'll be normal. And large is bigger than 30. So my sample size is 40. And 40 is bigger than 30. Right? Actually, let me write it this way. N, which is 40, is bigger than 30. And therefore, I know I've got normal 
independent. Independent is actually the hardest one to do. It seems a little strange, but it is because a lot of times you have to kind of logic your way through it. And random is always the easiest one because random is either going to be given to you in the problem. It'll say random or it'll be kind of like, oh, it's safe to assume it's random because we, we kind of can't deal with things that are not random. Everything we do has to be random. All right, so now we're going to describe the sampling distribution. Ah, okay. So going back to the central limit theorem, think about what we just did. So if you look at the box, we just worked through the three conditions, random, independent, normal. So we did those three. Once we have those three, then we can describe the distribution, which is the shape center spread piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shape. Well, the shape is normal. <laughs> we just proved it, right? So shape normal. Right, this will be what describing the distribution means. Center. Okay, well the center we learn from before is the mean of x bars, so give it the symbol. So that's what it means when I say symbols right there. So mu sub x bar, which is mu, which was right here, has a mean of 12.2. That's mu. 12.2. So 12.2 years. It has units on this one. The spread is the most difficult part. Normal is proven kind of right here, so that's done. And center is pretty easy. So the spread is the sigma sub x bar, which is sigma over the square root of n. Sigma was right here. Standard deviation, so sigma is 9.9. .9. So I'm going to use 9.9 .9 over the square root, and n was 40. And that's perfectly fine. You can actually leave it like that, but eh, it's a little weird, <laughs> you know? I mean, who says, well, there's 9.9 .9 divided by the square root of 40 as your spread? Nobody. So we can find what that is. It's 9.9 .9 divide square root 40. Don't forget that division. For some reason, a lot of people forget that. And we get 1.5653. The more decimal places we keep, the more accuracy we're going to have. So it's just, it just pays to keep accuracy. Now, if we know that it's normal and has a center and spread, that means that we're going to be able to find probabilities associated with that. Uh, we'll see that in the next video, but for the same problem.